welcome. Uh, before we get started, I would like all of our viewers to know that we are excited to offer greater accessibility to our programs through closed captioning and ASL. So if you would like to access closed captioning, please go to the bottom right of your screen and make sure you turn on closed captioning. So good afternoon and thank you for joining us today for Spotlight, Spotlight on Law Enforcement Anti-Bias Programs. The next in the National Law Enforcement Museum's very popular series of virtual programs. Due to COVID, our physical doors are temporarily closed, but we remain committed to our mission and our work to expand and enrich the relationships shared by law enforcement and the communities they serve. Today, we focus on training programs for law enforcement that aim to reduce biases within the community. Our role today is to bring together thought leaders on anti-bias training from around the country to discuss what is working and what needs improvement. When the National Law Enforcement Museum, located in Washington, D.C., opened in late 2018, we launched an exhibition that focused on law enforcement in five communities from around the nation and how their solution-based programs connected law enforcement with their communities. Today, that focus remains. As we explore how anti-bias training programs help law enforcement officers to continue to work towards building better relationships within their communities. Please join me in offering special recognition and thanks to today's sponsors, Target and Thomson Reuters, two companies whose core values clearly ref reflect their desire to connect law enforcement with communities by helping the National Law Enforcement Museum to set the table for meaningful and impactful conversations. Now for some brief housekeeping items before I introduce our keynote speaker. All attendees are muted. If you would like to ask a question, please submit your question through the Q&A tab. Note that everyone in the webinar will see your question. You can upvote questions submitted by other attendees. We will prioritize answering the questions that receive the most votes. A link to the recording of this webinar will be sent to everyone in two days and will also be available on the museum's YouTube channel. Panelists, please remember to keep yourselves on mute when you are not speaking. I would like to introduce our keynote speaker, Sharon Sales Belton. Sharon is the Vice President of Strategic Partnerships and Alliance of Thomson Reuters Government. She oversees development and management of private sector partnerships and government, legal, and law enforcement trade associations. Sharon served as mayor of Minneapolis from 1994 to 2001. She is the first woman and first African-American to be elected mayor. During her time in office, she achieved national recognition as an expert on public-private par public partnerships and public safety, neighborhood revitalization, and economic development. She served on the Minneapolis City Council for 10 years from 1984 to 1994 and was council president from 1990 to 1994. Sharon? Thank you for inviting me to join today's panel on anti-bias policing training. I'm delighted to be here and to share my perspectives on the subject before the esteemed panel of experts discuss their experience delivering training programs to law enforcement professionals. Prior to being elected to the Minneapolis City Council and later as mayor, I worked for the Minnesota Department of Corrections, first as a parole officer and later as the assistant director of the state program for victims of sexual assault. I spent much of my career there developing and providing training programs for medical, legal, and law enforcement professionals to combat the bias against victims of rape and incest. 
As much of that bias was societal and widespread, we also developed major public awareness campaigns in an effort to stem the societal bias. While it has taken significant time to improve the treatment of victims of sexual assault, I think we can all attest to the fact that progress has been made. That progress required and continues to require advocacy for change, one, two, the development of standardized procedures, and three, a system of accountability. My experience at the Department of Corrections gives me confidence that we can, as cities, states, and as a nation, improve and restore the trust between our communities and the police. It must start with an acceptance that bias, including racial bias, has been embedded in our institutions. It is not just a problem in policing. The focus, the current focus of public outrage is really that police bias can result in the immediate loss of life by lethal means. Now the opening paragraph of the 21st century policing report states that trust between law enforcement agencies and the people they protect and serve is essential in a democracy. It is key to the stability of our communities, the integrity of our criminal justice system, and the safe and effective delivery of policing services. That trust, sadly, continues to be eroded as more reports of harassment, unlawful detention, excessive use of force, and the death of African-American men and women are more widely witnessed via social media. In addition, post-incident reports from officer-worn body cameras has provided additional level of insight into the actions of arresting officers. The most recent killing of George Floyd in Minneapolis, Minnesota, shocked that city, the nation, and people all over the globe. I believe that even the most enthusiastic supporters of law enforcement raise their eyebrows after watching the video. Now, why and how could something as egregious as this happen? Surely, the officers involved in this call for service had received training on how to de-escalate a potentially volatile situation, or perhaps received unconscious bias training to ensure that the response to the suspect was appropriate to the situation and not compromised by discriminatory beliefs or attitudes of the arresting officer. Across the nation, citizens are demanding that elected officials defund and dismantle the police departments in response. There is a strong sentiment behind this demand for radical change because, because past initiatives to change police culture and behavior in their minds have failed or falling short of expectation. Today, leaders in law enforcement, joined by elected officials, legal scholars, advocates for the rule of law and justice equity, as well as citizens, are demanding that more be done and that it be done now. As a former mayor of the city of Minneapolis, a former victim advocate, and a parole officer and an engaged citizen. I wholeheartedly agree. Now let's ask a question. What did we expect would happen? Is it really rational to think that four hours or maybe even eight hours of unconscious bias training, implicit bias or procedural justice was going to or will change the attitudes of individual officers that may have been exposed to a lifetime of bias and stereotyping that is pervasive in our society? Is it logical to think that training programs with no processes to ensure officers are held accountable to incorporate the training into the way they perform 
their duties would actually result in fewer complaints? A question that I ask is, do incident reports require that officers provide information about their encounters with citizens to equip supervisory staff with the needed information uh, uh, necessary to assess compliance with performance standards? Is it reasonable to believe that there are no consequences for violations of standards and that any officer would feel compelled to comply with those standards or report violations of those standards to the appropriate internal authorities? These are important questions that citizens are asking and leaders in law enforcement should and must be able to answer. Reviews of the adoption of new protocols for policing should have, must have standard operating procedures, must be standard operating procedures. And they should not be associated only with criminal and administrative investigations. Active steps must be taken to prevent the training from being a check the box experience. The question that I wanna also raise this afternoon is that is it possible to train our way out of the problem of bias policing or the excessive use or lethal, excessive or lethal use of force against black and brown people? We all know that there are officers in some of our police departments that have a record of bias in their performance. Is it possible that vulnerability towards bias could have been detected before they were hired, or at the very least identified earlier in their career so that it could have been addressed? Now that said, maybe the best way to address problems of biased policing is to improve a recruitment process. But as social scientists, science indicates that there's evidence that societal and environmental exposure can have an effect on an individual's reactions to threat and to stress. Given that law enforcement officers are recruited from a variety of different backgrounds, and in some instances, most instances, are exposed daily to the stresses of the communities where they work, it is critical to understand how differential life experiences can create, when combined with community experience, stress, risk for stress vulnerability. I think these are important questions that we need to take into consideration. I'm here today to listen and to learn. And my personal goal is to take back to my colleagues and my community new information that will help us reimagine and build a model of policing for our communities that is fair and just for everyone. Thank you so much, and I look forward to listening to our esteemed panel. Thank you, Sharon. I uh, re really appreciate it. And I appreciate all of your support and your attendance in many of our events uh, when we were open, uh, when the museum was open, as well as uh, for you being here today. So thank you. I would like to introduce Dr. Booker Hodges. Dr. Hodges is currently Assistant Commissioner of Law Enforcement for the Minnesota Department of Public Safety. Dr. Hodges has been a diversity instructor for 18 years. His extensive career includes school resource officer, patrol deputy, narcotics detective, SWAT operator, patrol overnight watch commander, inspector, under sheriff, the acting chief deputy, and the chief of police. A NAACP leader, Dr. Hodges, is the only active police officer in history, in the history of the NAACP to serve as a branch president. In addition, Booker also serves as the chapter president for Noble, the National Organization of Black Law Enforcement Executives. Booker, I would like to turn it over to you and thank you for joining us today. 
All right, can you hear me? Are we I good can. on the line? All right, cool. So I just want to thank everybody for uh, coming out today and listening to us and to the uh, National Law Enforcement Memorial Museum for hosting this uh, important topic. And I'm glad to be here. Um, the issue of bias, basically, if you think about it in terms of modern history and how it's gotten uh, thrust into the forefront in 2000, uh, around 2000, we were really starting to have this discussion on uh, racial profiling and then 9-11 happened. And we had to take that discussion and put it on the back burner of the stove. And anything that, you know, for those of you who can cook, unlike me, uh, anything that you take and put on the back burner of the stove, eventually it's going to boil over, right? So every few years, uh, this, this pot keeps boiling over. And my, my hope is, is that with panels like this, uh, that we can move forward and we can take the pot off the back of the stove and that we can move forward as a society. So with that, uh, we have a great panel here for you today. Um, and I am really grateful that uh, they've graced me with their presence. Seriously, I mean, we have some phenomenal people here today and I think you're gonna get a lot out of what they have to say. So the panelists, uh, they're gonna introduce themselves and how they answer their questions because we know that our time is limited and we wanna really give you something to walk away with here. So my first question for our panelists is, as we're talking about bias, um, can someone answer specifically what is anti-bias training? Anyone? This is Dwayne Crawford. Hello, Booker. How are you? Good. How are you doing? How's the listening audience out there? Uh, this is Dwayne Crawford, the director for the National Organization of Black Law Enforcement Executives and Greetings, also from our national president, Linda Williams. I'll, I'll go ahead and respond quickly here. Um, uh, to me, it's really how we are able to train our law enforcement personnel and really anyone in your organization on how to understand uh, biases you may have, or lack of a better word, um, stereotypes you may have about certain people and how that may also influence how you are able to protect and serve a person or a community or an organization by having predetermined uh, stereotypes uh, based on maybe someone's race or where they live or their class in, in this nation. Anyone else? I would uh, add that at its best, anti-bias training um, is a long-term thing. It's a uh, not a one-day workshop or a check. It's something that includes skills. It's something that includes longevity with a plan attached to it. It, uh, it I mean, when we talk about once we identify the anti-biases, the hard work is in helping people not let them control their thinking. I want to add on to that. So I'm on a plus one. On, oops, sorry, Faye. I want to plus one. So again, thank you for the invitation, um, Dr. Tracy, because see the Center for Policing Equity. I agree. Um, that is what the training is supposed to do. But I think I go back and back up just a little bit. What are we trying to solve for? Um, I think that's what has to be answered. And all too often, um, implicit bias training, anti-bias training is used for solve for something much deeper. And so I just I wanted to lift that up. Right, and so I'm Faye Brooks. I'm a retired chief of detectives with the King County Sheriff's Office. I'm having spent 26 years with them, and now I'm a director of a co-director of law enforcement programs for the National Coalition Building Institute. One of the things that we um, understand about biases is we all have them. People may think you don't, but you all have them. And so the the anti-bias training I think is is a way to acknowledge and recognize what your biases are so that you can then, as good people, um, decide which ones are going to be beneficial or which ones are going to be problematic, uh, cause uh, injury to others or harm to others or uh, to interfere with your relationship with the community. So once you become aware of your biases, then you get to um, look at how can you then come up with some ways to uh, change that um, because uh, as and both of, me, both of my colleagues have already indicated, it's not, uh, it's something that we get over time. And uh, one of the things that the mayor mentioned about psychological testing with new hires and other officers who've been on a while, um, there are tests that certainly can determine, you know, propensity for, uh, for biases. But as you've been on longer and longer and longer on a department, 
I am uh, a, a proponent of re-examining that uh, information so that you can see what the cumulative effect has been of how you interact with people. My name's Patrick Yos. I'm, I'm the president of National Fraternal Order Police, and I'd like to, to add to that as well. You know, bias training is a, you know, it's, it's a buzzword that we like to throw out there, and, and we're having a lot of discussion about it right now, but I'll take it a, a step further. You know, we talk about culture, and, and culture is very key within our own agencies as well. And it really starts at the very top, and that culture is what, uh, what allows us to, to kind of build on. You know, we can talk about bias training all we want, uh, but the relative, you know, what, what makes it relative is the interactions in the, in the community-based relationships that we build long before we have crisis in our communities. And that is so vitally important to this. You know, we can, we can put, uh, we can put water on a fire all we want, but really at the end of the day, it's all about those relationships we created way in advance that allowed us to not only learn about you know, bias, but it also allows us to truly understand the different cultures. All right, there's one term that I did not hear anybody say when they discussed uh, bias, and it's the term of race. So what I want to go around and ask people is, is there a difference between bias and racism? And if so, what? And if not, why do you think that? Who wants to jump first into the to the pit on that one? I'll go I first. like it. Go ahead, Guillermo. I'll go right behind you. So uh, I didn't introduce myself before. I'm Guillermo Lopez, and I co-direct the uh, law enforcement partnership program for uh, National Coalition Building Institute. And so, well, of course, racism plays a big part in how biases get developed. Uh, sexism plays a big part, uh, homophobia. They, they all intersect when it comes to anti-bias. But I think in this place and time that we're in, if we don't talk about how is it that we deconstruct institutional racism, we're missing the whole point. So whatever programs we do, it has to be centered around uh, interrupting institutional racism, dismantling institutional racism. So, and, it, and it's not just in anti-bias training, it's at all levels of training that we have to include this. So really quick, I think the, the question you were asking was, how are these different? So I'm going to, first of all, agree and plus one on what Guillermo just said. They occupy the same space. And what's going on now is the definitions of each of these things and how you define them. And I'm going to tell you that across the country, people are defining these things very differently. How you define it really is going to determine your approach to it. So for example, um, for the center, we define racism as accumulated patterns of behaviors that disadvantages one racial group and advantages another. And that can also include systems, policies, and all the things that facilitate that. But you can understand that if you're doing automatic associations of groups with stereotypes, how that type of perspective, and, and whether it's explicit or implicit, influences each of those things, right? So you can be explicit about not liking people of color. Um, and you can very much count on that you were influenced by something in that space that has you making those particular outcomes. But I think what we're really talking about here is that oftentimes these two things are conflated. That if you want to talk about implicit bias or anti-bias training, you're therefore calling me a racist. And that is not what's happening here. And I, and I have to say that. The other part of this too is how people are oriented around this space. And we can't forget, and I want to say on the opening comments, you know, people are coming from different lived perspectives, different family members are talking about things in a different way. And Patrick was on point when he talked about culture. So it's not just about the broader culture, it's also about the culture of policing inside those buildings, what happens there. And so we get into these spaces where we're trying to disentangle how much of this can we control for and how much can we not. And I can tell you the thing that we can't control for is that somebody, even if we do implicit bias training, which I think is, I don't call it training, I call it awareness, but even if we do do that, 
one of the things you have to remember is the power of the influence of all of those things that help you make those quick automatic stereotypal, you know, sort of associations. Even if we train our young folks, what typically happens when we hear from the younger recruits, when they go home for Christmas and you're sitting at a table with ma, pa, and uncle, and everybody else who feel a certain way or believe a certain way about a certain group of folks, it's really hard for somebody to step up and break out of that or to stay silent and sit back from that. So it's a really difficult thing to disentangle, and I understand why people conflate it, but the definitions are critically important on how we begin to address it. So I just wanted to make sure that I, that I offered that up. Anybody else? So I'm gonna stay on this one a little bit because I think nationally, and just based on my experience, this is um, one of the areas where we tend to get caught up on um, in terms of how do we define bias and racism and are they the same thing, right? Because can somebody be biased and not be a racist? I'm gonna argue yes. I mean, like I'm from Minnesota. I like the Vikings. I do not like the Packers, right? So am I biased against Green Bay? Absolutely, <laughs> you know? But I mean, I'm just, I'm putting it in, in that context. But I do think if we really wanna have a discussion and permeate all fields, we really have to discuss what is the difference between being biased and being racist. And, and you said something that I really want to go to that I really think is, is key here is when you said uh, how you define it will determine how you approach it. And I think that a lot of times when people aren't, if you don't have the, the, the terminology right, or if you're not speaking the same language, sometimes you get shut down. I mean, for everybody on here is teaching, you know, if you teach this in law enforcement long enough, if you come in and say something that's anti or something that's biased, automatically officers are assuming that you're talking about race. So I just really want to get back to this. Um, if, 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 if our panelists could try to give us in their definition, and I know, Doctor, you, you touched on it um, briefly, too. What do you think? How could we go about defining the difference between bias and racism? This is a Dwayne again. Um, I think when I look at racism, it's a fundamental belief that a person's color is superior than another person's color. So if I'm African American, I feel that me being African American is superior to say someone that's white. And so the reality of it is that's a very real, uh, 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 to me, a very real and deliberate belief that you've got. Um, and when I look at bias, I look at those are more that could be byproducts of this. But I think you're absolutely correct. If a person is fundamentally racist, uh, that's a strong line you've drawn that says you really believe your skin color is superior to that of someone else. Anybody else? All right, so we'll go through to the next question. Um, is in your experience, can you tell us if anti-bias training has been effective or not? at reducing bias within law enforcement. Um, well, as, as my colleagues, excuse me, as my colleagues have said, no. this training needs to be more than just a one-off, right? It needs to be uh, consistent. It needs to be um, uh, embedded within the agency as well. And so it, it has a tendency to make people aware for a short amount of time um, until they get back into the system and start doing and have that pressure from outside to continue to, to treat people um, in, a, in an unfair way, uh, either by, by bias, which is, you know, uh, you just have a, have a feeling about something, you, you know, uh, favor one side versus another, but with the racism, it's, it's like systematic. And if the system says, um, that uh, someone can spend 20 years in prison because he attempted to steal hedge clippers, right? He attempted to steal hedge clippers. And then when he wants to get appealed, to appeal it, the courts don't show him an appeal. To me, that's a racist system. And the, the, the effort needs to be more in-depth and in looking at how we fix systems. And in this country, as we're learning from history, um, it was built on a racist mindset. And so we're working to fix that because we are, you know, like um, Maya Angelou said, when I, I did what I did then, 
because that's what I do. Well, if I know better, I do better. And I think we're at the point in this country where we are starting to know better and we want to do better. And a way to do this is to start talking about this issue because it's not going to go away if we don't talk about it and if we don't face it and we don't come up with um, models and ways to um, improve and encourage each other on how to interact with each other. Anybody else? Is uh, anti-bias training effective? And if not, um, why not? And if so, why do you think it's been effective? So I'll take a, Go ahead. This is Pat Yos. I'll take a, uh, if I could, let me, let me just tell you, tell you what my experience is in 36 years of law enforcement and a little bit of, of military training on, on, bi on, uh, on this topic. Um, I think we need to look at what adult learners are. Adult learners, uh, they process things a little differently than everyone else. And, and the main one is they need to know why it's relevant and it needs to be timely. Well, clearly we have a timely uh, discussion here. The question is, is, is it relevant? And, and I can tell you over the years, I, I've attended uh, different training. And I, I, when, you, when you look at, at, at an individual, uh, it, was, it was mentioned earlier and I have to agree with, we all have a certain amount of bias that, uh, that we all have. And, and, and in, in most cases, we don't even realize we have it. Uh, what the other thing we have is, is we we tend to get really offended when people suggest or, or even have the discussion that the way it's framed makes it sound like we we are racist. So I think when you when you're talking to an adult learner and you want to you want to you know convey this message, the effectiveness of this training is truly going to have an impact on whether it's relevant or not, or how it's approached. Um, you know, it, it's a, an open mind. Uh, is going to have a a, a a lot more opportunity to 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 be able to share those cultural differences that that we all make up our biases make us make us more conscious of it. But if it's not approached properly, and I've experienced those where where I don't feel they were they were, they were approached properly, that uh, you know this kind of falls on deaf ears too. So um, I think it, I think there's no doubt it it's, it's effective, but it all is in a delivery of it as well. All right. So I see we got. Oh, go ahead. Yeah, if I could. So, um, so I, it, that sounds right to me. And, and, you know, Patrick doesn't need me to co-sign on this, but I think where I'm struggling here is that even the science tells you that it gives you mixed results. And so the conversation, again, is really about what are we trying to solve for? So if we want officers to be aware that they come with biases and how those things are um, how they come to be and how do you try to manage that because that's the other thing right so how do you slow that process down so you're not making the automatic associations but it, again it goes about it's not just about delivery um, it is about some self-reflective things that have to happen with each individual officer about where they stand in this moment and what's going on because this is about race as well and you can't avoid that conversation and oftentimes we try to use this training to avoid that conversation. And I agree, it's, it's always in the approach, but I would be remiss as a black woman who's been in policing for 30 years, if I don't lift up the fact that people are exhausted and tired of making people feel okay about this conversation. And so I think I go back to what, what is the shared language here? What do we need to do so that we all can make sure one, we're on the same definition as much as possible, but we're all solving or trying to discuss and find solutions for the exact same thing. Because where we get stuck are folks being so offended by the conversation of the training that we never move any, any forward. And, and I think that, you know, I, I can go back and most of us can, Dwayne, you can too, and, and so can you, Faye, when the early diversity trainings were extremely offensive, right? I mean, we sat there and shook our heads like, what is this about? But I think what's different here is if you talk about the science that supports it. But also, you have to talk about the practicality and the reality of how this is being done. And it's one thing to bring recruits or officers in a classroom for eight hours on the Faye, you have to have it consistent. But it also has to be measured. Because if we're not, if we're putting people through this and nothing's happening, then we need to do something different. Um, we sort of seem to be reluctant to do that. But we also need to be able to help officers understand why these moments, why this moment it has come because I, I've been thousands of officers, even as my time at NYPD, they don't understand why this conversation is important and why it's necessary. So I agree with Pat, you got you have to be able to explain why. You don't have to believe it. You don't necessarily have to accept it, but you need to understand why and why there's other lived perspectives and experiences around 
what's going on now. So I think that for me, that the whole adult learner part is 100%, but it's more than that. It's what you're bringing to that classroom. If you're already thinking this is going to offend you, then I have to ask what's going on with you, because those are never the intent, typically. And not, I'm not going to say all instructors are great, because I've seen some that have just been horrible, but I mean, we really need to start being practical about what we're trying to solve for here. Thank you. And I know we have uh, Mayor Cheryl Sells Belton joined back on. I don't know if you had anything you wanted to add to this uh, this question here about do you think the training is effective? Uh, if not, why not? And if so, why so? I don't know if I can answer the question now. Uh, uh, why not? But I do um, I do resonate with the comment that uh, Dr. Uh, Tracy uh, put on the table, and that is the you know the competency, um, the construct of the of the training. Um, because you get what you, you get out what you put in, uh, and uh, I actually believe that uh, there ought to be some uh, standards across the board uh, for what ought to be included in the training. And uh, there are a number of reports uh, that uh, talk about the role uh, that these uh, post boards can play in ensuring that there's some uniformity, you know, across uh, the uh, states. There needs to be more conversation about that if we again are trying to uh, you know get improvements or we, we're acknowledging that improvements are needed across the board thank you does anybody else have anything else to add on this question before i move on to the next one? Oh uh, yeah i would i i would just want to say um that yes it works when all the parts that are needed are in play and um so you have to start with assessing the particular group you're working with versus coming in with just uh, one uh, a one fits all one size fits all you have to assess the needs of the particular department you're working with the group you're working with and and then uh, whoever the facilitators are um, they have to tr the department has to trust them just just between the facilitators and the department there has to be trust built there so that they trust uh, we're not trying to sell them a, a bag of goods and 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 then included in there you need skills skills that talk about relationship skills that talk about that uh, we listen with intent to learn skills of those nature and when you develop strong relationships even within the department you're willing to talk about these more difficult things and so until you get to that needs assessment build trust within the department and then you can go after some of the hard stuff which when you do that then you're prepped to go into the community to hear the harder conversations with them so i want to stay on you for a second because i know you do this work can you just briefly tell us about you know like what's your experience with with this type of training um yeah uh, uh, chief brooks and i have been doing this for uh probably about 15 years together now. And uh, so we do a partnership where I'm from the community and she's from law enforcement. And early on, we had to figure out how is it that, um, how do we bridge each other? How do we, how do we, uh, how does she as a police officer, a law enforcement individual, break the barrier with community as a black woman also, and me as a Latino man um, who's not law enforcement, how do I gain the trust of the officers? And let me tell you what I figured out in the beginning. And I'm a retired steel worker. I worked 27 years in the steel mill and I was involved with the union. And when I closed my eyes and listened to the muster room of officers, I thought I was in the steel mill. They were working class kind of people. And if you don't understand that when you're working with them, you will never gain their trust. And, and it was, I was just very fortunate that that's what I came from and I was able to use that experience to help them. Listen, I'm here to help you. Once we gained their trust, and, and one more thing I wanna say, this training to be most effective doesn't mean that every officer in the department is gonna be the best at it. There are gonna be some officers that probably will go take the training and not want anything to do with it anymore and that does not make them a bad police officer. But then you're gonna have other officers who are gonna to take to this like a duck to water. And they're the ones that cause the change within the institution. They're the ones that make change with the community. 
And when you have a significant portion of people working in this way, rowing together, departments change, communities get better. We have difficult conversations because we want to be together. And I'd like to add to, add to what Guillermo uh, just said as well, is that what we also do with the training is that we acknowledge and recognize that police is a culture as well. And so we don't go into the training pointing fingers saying, you're bad, you have to do this, you need to do this. We also have an opportunity for the police officers to acknowledge and be appreciated for their culture because we have a culture. That is important when you go and you meet with community, because a lot of times police officers have the, have the sense that um, I can't show my emotions, I can't share anything with you, I have to just be just about the facts. When actually, if, if you can lower your guard just a little bit, I'm not saying um, interfere with officer safety, but what I am saying is when you, when you connect with community on a human level, and they start to appreciate and trust you, because they feel like you know what they're talking about, as opposed to just coming in, taking a report, checking the box, and then leaving. Um, spending a couple extra minutes just listening to their stories means a lot. And it puts that, that, that uh, money in the bank, as it were, because it's not an if, it's a when. When something's going to happen, <laughs> you want some money in the bank with the community so that they have a, a sense that they can trust you. And uh, over the years, it, that hasn't been as important as it needs to be. One more thing I want to say is mm -hmm. that it's important to separate the difference between being uncomfortable and unsafe. We would never ask a police department or train anybody into not trusting their safety training. Absolutely trust your safety training. But there has to be a place where uncomfortable, and I can tell you in my life, the places where I have learned the most is when I was uncomfortable. But you separate when you're unsafe and you're uncomfortable and lean into the uncomfortable because that's where we learn the most. And I mean, I think most people can relate to, to that uh, feeling uncomfortable. It's gross. But I'm going to take a voluntary second here. Speaker's preference. I know, don't, don't mute me. But um, I just want to thank you all again for participating and just let you know that uh, the National Law Enforcement Museum, which is uh, putting this on, uh, I'm going to put a link in the uh, chat if you choose to support it. Please do. Uh, they bring in some solution based uh, conversations to the public. And if, you know, I know when they open their doors up, they got very nice keychains. Uh, last time I was in DC, I bought some for my kid. Um, and I'm pretty sure that, <laughs> you know, they had, they had some nice, nice events in there. Um, it's a phenomenal building if you ever get a chance in DC to visit it. But again, though, um, if you do get an opportunity, please click on the link and support them. Uh, Cause again, they're, they're out here trying to provide some really timely topics and some solutions. So with that, uh, next question I'm going to ask for the panelists is, do you believe that uh, bias training or anti-bias training should be taught in schools or to community members also? Yes. <laughs> oh, <wow. laughs> I don't like to ask answer that question, but uh, you know, if so, if so, why? Why? And, why? And, and let me go, why and what would that look like? I know I threw that last link in there. What would so um, I think it should be taught in schools, in community education programs, in court systems, in judicial systems, for attorneys, for everybody, because every person has biases. And all of those uh, entities have an impact, negative or positive, in the community. So how would that look like? Similar to what we do with law enforcement training um, and with community. Um, we bring community and law enforcement together. We talk to them about um, how to interact with people and, and thinking about customer service. Now, that back when I was on early in my career, um, one of my uh, lieutenants sent out a, around an article for, for us in the mobile phone room to hear about customer service. You can imagine what the reaction was, right? We don't have any customers. Well, if the city could fire you, um, and my agency had that opportunity uh, with us, um, it would change your mindset about customer service. So what is it about going to a store that keeps you going back to the store? The elements of customer service are tone of voice, how you interact with people, being reliable, being responsive, 
those elements fit with law enforcement. They can also fit with community um, because you know community has us versus them as well, and they don't trust the police when um, actually, uh, if we spent more time together, we would be trusting each other more. So that, that sort of is a little bit of why I said yes so quickly. <laughs> Thank you, Doctor. If, if I could, I'd, I'd like to 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 uh, also just uh, piggyback right on what you said. I, I've always always said and, and 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 truly believe that that it is all about customer service. And I actually teach a class specifically about that. It's all about the relationships we build. You know, as law enforcement officers, we're allowed to do. You know, we're we're granted a certain amount of powers, but those powers don't come without a responsibility on our part uh, to be able to have that community uh, support and trust. And uh, so so. I, I agree that uh, that a good balanced uh, dialogue and discussion on the cultural uh, diversity of people and, and the way we process things differently can do nothing but uh, but cause us to do a lot of a lot of uh, reflection on ourselves and our own our own beliefs and uh, I, I think if it's done properly absolutely we can benefit from that but I, I will absolutely have to agree with chief. Uh, we are in the business of customer service, and, and the way we deliver that service is going to determine whether or not we meet the expectations of our communities. And, and if you look at what's going on across the country right now, I think it just uh, illustrates that we have a lot of work to do. Thank you, sir. Anybody else want to chime in on that one? I'll just add to that and just say also, keep in mind, schools represent our future workforce in law enforcement. So you've got this amazing opportunity to talk to young people. Uh, nobody has a lot of program in schools right now, but I would tell you that's a great, great opportunity to begin to recruit and educate and inform these young people about our profession, about what our, what our morale, our morales are, our ethics, and we believe in. There's an opportunity to protect and serve their own communities. But the biggest thing is a pipeline to our profession. You know, so, Booker, I would just say okay. that uh, many cities across the uh, country have uh, established uh, police community academies uh, where uh, community members and law enforcement officers are you know, working together to understand, assess the problems in the community, and then also learn something about uh, each other uh, and uh, the rules and the processes and procedures associated uh, with policing. A lot of people don't have this information and it's very helpful in building a you know, foundation for relationships the police uh, athletic leagues, uh, the community block clubs where police officers are assigned to very specific neighborhoods and given the time that they need to build uh, relationships that are based on mutual respect. These things all you know, have a way of helping uh, to uh, bridge the gap that um, exists between our police departments and our communities. Uh, these programs are not, you know, fluff, wish we could do kinds of things. These things are really important uh, and uh, critical uh, to have establishing you know, positive police community relations. One of the reasons why I'm such a fan of the work uh, that uh, Noble does is they have a specific strategy associated with reaching out to the children in the communities uh, where their chapters are, are present. This builds a pipeline for um, you know, for recruits, but it also just builds, you know, a long-standing relationship, you know, of mutual trust and respect. And you never know when you might have to tap into, you know, those uh, relationships to get some support uh, that uh, law enforcement needs in our community to more effectively do their job. Thank you. So I'm gonna add a caveat to this question that I want people to, to weigh in on. If um, police come from society, right? Police, the foundation of policing is based in society. People, uh, humans make up police forces. All of the talk has been about anti-bias training for law enforcement. And it seems like the expectation is, is that we're gonna take training and give it to people when they join the profession but should the more of the emphasis be on trying to focus on that training in a foundational set framework as the vast majority of public, or excuse me, as the vast majority of law enforcement officers all come from the public. And if people believe that we should focus on the public, 
And here's the jump in the water question. How do we teach the public now to not cast all police officers in the same light when one police officer or a few police officers make public mistakes? Can you repeat your question one more time? I missed the last part. Oh, I said, so uh, law enforcement officers come from, uh, the foundation of law enforcement officers is, is general public. So I said, do you think uh, bias training would be better focused, just two part, would bias training be better focused on dealing with the community right now? And if so, in this current environment, how do we teach uh, the public that, excuse me, how would we frame it, the conversations around people casting lights on the entire law enforcement profession based on the actions of a few officers? And essentially right now you got kids out there that the minute they see somebody in a uniform, you know, it doesn't matter who that person is, it's just you have a uniform on. So how, how should we go about focusing the training more in society in conjunction with law enforcement? And how would we work that training now to teach people not to view police officers all in the same light? I like the question, but I think that these are not mutually exclusive, right? Mm -hmm. So these, these things have to happen simultaneously. But the other part that we have to talk about is why folks are ascribing the events of one person to an entire group of people, right? And, and what the community would tell you, it's the same thing they believe police officers do about the black community. One person does something wrong and the entire community is paying the price for that. And so mm -hmm. that, for me, that's where it starts. We, you know, I think it was said earlier, we have so many similarities on where we want to be um, that we're gonna have to be able to unpack that. And I think before you can bring groups together to have that conversation, those are in those are in cultural conversations, right? So if we talk about historically how people perceive them being viewed by other folks, cops are talking about the same thing, right? You're you're saying that you know this one person in Minneapolis, and we're all that way. We're not all that way. That message is getting lost, as is it is when you have a person of color commit a crime. We're not all that way. That's one person. Why are we being attached to the individual decision that was made of others? We're talking the same language. For some reason, we can't hear each other. And so to me, that's where that training begins. We're, in a, we're all occupying the same space, living in two different worlds. It, I would have never believed it when I was younger if somebody would have told me that. We're speaking different languages, but we're all trying to get to the same space. The training for me is that's a part of it, right? So it's just a small part of it. Um, I think most, depending on who you talk to, would say they have biases. They have biases against police officers and vice versa. But it is that process we do together to get there. So I don't think you have to do one before the other. I think all of that work should be happening now. But in order for work to happen in that way, you still have to address the things that are coming up. For some reason, we just want to sort of put aside historically what has happened. And for some, everybody's like, it's history, it wasn't me. But it's also a signal that you don't understand the power of that uniform and what it meant historically and currently for some folks. We're not talking about ancient history, we're talking about recent history. So I think there's ways in which we have to have these conversations and teach folks, but I also have to remind community that cops don't make policy. I have stood in more community meetings about cops doing things that cops were told to do. And if you wanna start yelling at somebody, the chief needs to be, you know, forgive me, my, my former chief, push that chief up front and have them answer to that. Answer why you've decided that this was the way you wanted to approach it. And this is when we talk about why organizations have to have diversity through the ranks, because there are different lived experiences, there are different perspectives, but these aren't two separate things. I don't think you do one before the other. Everybody's got work to do and, and they need to get to work. That's the only thing I can tell you. So everybody's got work to do. And if I could piggyback on what Dr. Kesey just said, um, when we do an assessment of the department, we also do an assessment with the community because you can't do it without both of them. And so we ask the community the same question we're asking the police. Um, what is going well? What could be better? What would you be willing to do to make a change and to make a difference? And if you could change something, what would you change? And based on that assessment, that's how we develop the training that we provide to the police and to the community. Sometimes the, community, the police, it, and actually, we also preface the training by providing the information in a sort of a uh, but not, a, not a test, but a, an awareness of what the training is going to be like to the police before we bring them to the community. 
because uh, you know police officers don't like to share a lot of information um, and they don't want to uh, uh, reveal much. So they just want to know what is, we don't like surprises. So what's the training going to be like? And we found that when we take that step first, it helps the training go better because there's really no surprises in terms of the model. The surprises may come with the discussion, but that's a different, that's a different. And that's okay, because like Yerna said, it's uncomfortable. You lean into being uncomfortable, and then you have a better relationship after the end of it. I would I say- like, I like, go ahead, I'm sorry, go ahead. Go ahead. I, I would add, uh, you know the old saying, the truth shall set you free? Mm -hmm. Well, when it comes to education, especially our young people, the truth that we teach them will set us all free. I was just going to add that uh, when we should all spend a few moments just, you know, thinking about um, what happens or what we think about when we deconstruct uh, the fact that um, African American uh, parents, parents, brown children all have to, uh, at, by age nine or 10 years old, have a talk with their children about what's, you know, what possibly could happen. And it's because of the stereotypes uh, uh, that um, that uh, Chief uh, Brooks and uh, Dr. Kesey have, you know, shared. We these stereotypes and these biases, um, you know, have been embedded in you know our our kind of our thought process and the way that we assess you know community, not just the police, but again, this is across the board. But we really need to you know understand that. Everybody's got a, a role to play uh, in kind of getting us where we need to go, but it starts with truth telling and people accepting, you know, responsibility, you know, for their, their, their actions. You know, I grew up with my parents giving me the talk. I gave my talk to my kids. You know, my kids, are, you know, are calling me after Philando Castile and saying, Mom, here's a guy who followed all the rules and he still got shot and killed. Am I really safe? These are not conversations that you really want to have with your children, but they're based on, again, people stereotyping people because of race, where they live, class, I mean, you name it, it happens. So thank you for that. Um, we got a bunch of uh, panel questions from people in the audience, but I'm gonna, we're gonna ask one more question here. And um, before we get to audience questions, and then I'm gonna ask if the panel could stay over a little bit later than we intended uh, due to the amount of questions that we have. Um, and we'll kind of go from there. So the question that I have, uh, just like many of you, I've, I've taught this topic um, all over the, the country. And you kind of see nationally a difference in uh, the police chief and the line officers, right? A lot of times you'll see line officers taking this training and the chief doesn't. Right, and even in, in a lot of cases, you'll even see how most chiefs are politically aligned in a different alignment than the line officers. Right, so what do you think? How do how would you suggest getting this training to the not only to the line officers, but specifically to the leadership of a law enforcement organization? Well, um, for us we know how important it is for leadership's buy-in. If we don't have buy-in from leadership, we, I'm pretty sure we've turned down uh, jobs because we couldn't get that. Mm -hmm. it, it just won't work. Um, if, if you don't have the leadership uh, walking the talk, why should the rest of the body follow? It just doesn't make sense when you don't have leadership taking it. So for us, it's, uh, it's, I, we, I can't imagine it doing it any other way. Um, and the other thing is we actually train leadership in a, uh, depending on how we assess it in a, in a more intense kind of way than we do the regular officers. Then we, and we actually do uh, a slightly uh, different version for cadets, uh, younger officers. Um, and uh, that uh, has proved for us in the assessments we get that it, it helps from, I don't wanna say get poisoned, but you know, when you're working a position 20 some years, you have a particular way of, of looking at it. 
And when a young officer comes in, I've heard more than one uh, said that uh, they're told, forget about what you learned in, in uh, the academy, I'll teach you what it's like. We have to strengthen the young officers to be able to resist that. And I am not condemning the officers that say that. I think we don't treat them well enough. Personally, I don't think anybody should be on the streets no more than three years at a time and then taken off for a year and put in a position where they're doing, I don't know, social service. My thinking of what police should be, policing should do is a whole lot different than we do it now. We don't treat police human enough and expect a lot from them in that sense. So in my best thinking, I think there should be a kind of rotation to help them uh, get through all the stuff that they figure out and get a better sense of the rest of the world. I it's interesting you say that, and then I'll get to Dr. Tracy here, and then after that, we'll get to audience questions. But that three-year rotation piece that you talk about, most places, if you work narcotics, you're out of there in three years because they know that you can't stay in that position for more than three years without something going broken. So with that, uh, Dr. Tracy? So I, th I think the question was, you know, leadership. What do you do with that crew? Well, I think Guillermo said it right. You train them first. Mm -hmm get more out of training that group to determine whether or not this is going to be legit or not. And you can tell when you finish who you're going to have problems with. And those are conversations that you have with the chief. Because if the message gets distorted from the top, if one one steps to the side and, and gets approached by a, a colleague and they ask for their opinion about what do you think and they go, I think it's, I think it's ridiculous, it's a done deal. And so it's really helping the chief understand not just the importance of it, but even looking at their own team. You're gonna have issues within a team, everybody knows that. But if you're all not on the same page about the perspective and the, and the sort of the road forward, then it's gonna be problematic. The other part that has to happen in that same space, and I think that you know, this is what we're talking about, is they have to unpack their own historical biases in that class, right? You come through the ranks, you've done some things, you've seen some things and you behave the way. And you can't act as if all of a sudden when you put stars on that you, it was not you because it was you. And the, anybody who's been raised in an organization long, and, long enough knows the history of our own folks. And so it's just, it's more than a class. It is really this, this self-reflective piece that has to be inserted into leadership for them to understand that you, you lead, but you also have to lead by example. And that's the thing I'm not hearing, right? Because we can, we can have them in class, but I can tell you, I've had many chiefs in class and then go to a side conversation and they start talking about things. I'm thinking, okay, well, that was a waste of time. So it's really about holding not just officers accountable, but the organization has to be held accountable to it as well. Yeah. Thank you for that. So we got some good audience questions and I'm actually glad I'm sitting here and not where you are today. So uh, the first <laughs> question uh, comes from a Mr. Uh, Williams and he says, uh, how do we address the conflict between the perception of racist behavior by police and the statistics that officers shoot black suspects at a rate lower than black suspects and shoot it, than black suspects shoot at officers and less than the rate of violent criminal acts against their own communities. So it depends on what report you're reading. So let's, let's start by grounding it in that way. But I want to speak more so to not just perception, but lived experience. And so as a scientist, I'm all for science. But there's one thing that you cannot ignore, and that's the lived true experience. Sometimes we do an over-reliance on science for that science to do the talking for us. It helps actually describe what's going on or what may or may not be happening. But the true work has to happen on the ground with police departments and community. And if you hear people say, well, you know, perception is someone's reality, which is very true, but lived experience and stories are truth. And one of the things that we have to keep from doing is trying to determine and impose who do we believe and who do we not believe? Because that's really what we're coming down to now, that it's not as bad as you think it is, or it is as bad as you think it is. It is really what is happening in the practicality of how you find that out. So, and the reason why I appreciate that question, because that is the crux of the conversation right? What's really happening? What's really not happening? And this is where we seem to get stuck. Um, and it's a space where I call analysis paralysis. We could do this all day. All you got to do is get five scientists, you're going to give you five different outcomes. 
what I always tell people to, to really think about is broaden how you're understanding and learning. But if you really want to know what's going on, talk to the people who are closest to the problem, the cops and the community. They will more than likely give you what you need or tell you what you need in order to start making course adjustments. So as a scientist, I'm telling you, I love science, but science only can get you so far. And it can also be done to believe what you want to believe, which I'm not saying is wrong or right, but you have to broaden and have a better understanding about the lived experience that people are telling you. Folks are not in the street for no reason. And, and you gotta understand that. Yeah, and this is beside the folks who are, who are destroying things in a violent manner, that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about 75 days of protesting, demonstrating, those who are doing it peacefully are there for a reason. That's what you need to start understanding is why. Don't get distracted by what we used to say, why the folks that are, you know, the knuckleheads are gonna do what they're gonna do. Try to understand why people are still in the streets. And it's not just about policing, by the way. So I just want to make sure I lift that up too. Anyone else? So I do think that this question is one that, that comes up a lot. And you know, I typically will tell people on this one, it's hard to have um, a, you know, when you got feelings versus a fact, right? I mean, and there's some difference. You can't have both cases, right? You can't have a feelings argument with a fact person and you can't have a fact argument with a feelings person it just doesn't work right so you have to get together and get to a space to where at some point you know you're gonna have to come to some resolution so i do think that that is um that is a good question to answer and then the last part of his question is how is it that we can address this perception that all, I'm, gonna, I'm adding the all term in here. How is it that we can address the perception that all law enforcement behavior is racist? I, I don't think everybody has that same perception. They don't think all, there's some, I'm not gonna say there's never anybody, there's some. But again, it goes back to the majority of the folks, the majority of the people and even the black community think that the police are, have a purpose. So you have to decide which sound bite you're listening to. But part of how you get rid of sort of this perception of, you know, all cops are racist really is how we hold ourselves accountable. And, and part of the big conversation that we've been having over the last three months has been about accountability and whether or not it's been consistent and whether or not, you know, one day we say we can fire somebody and most of us who, you know, been a part of a union would know there's a due process there. So it's, it's really about how do we then go about making sure that we understand that when we do absolutes and, and Dr. Booger, like you just said, it's like, it's, it's emotion versus fact, but we can't do absolutes because not everybody thinks that way. When we get caught up in those absolutes is where we come out not having a conversation. Not everybody in the black community thinks all white officers are racist. That, that's just it. There are gonna be some, but not all. And so I'm, that's, I'm like always careful with folks when we wanna have these conversations, let's not set up already it's they all think this because they all don't. They absolutely do not. Yeah, I think like there are more people right now who think that uh, we are not holding law enforcement officers accountable for their conduct. And I, and I think accountability is just something that we just can't lose sight of. So I'll go to uh, Mr. Uh, Patrick. Yeah, I just I wanted to, to piggyback on, on what was just said. Uh, you know, I, I think the problem that we have uh, is, is and, I, and I do not, I do not believe that everyone thinks police officers are racist. I do think that there is a, is a problem there, and I think it's one we need to, to, to take head on and have this dialogue. But I will say this, there is nothing that if, uh, if we sat down together and had some conversations and, and realistically had an open mind to have these discussions, we couldn't find solutions to. I think the problem that we have in this space and time right now is there's, there's just some people that just don't want that harmony. They don't want this dialogue and they do everything to kind of to stop it. Look, you can, you can lead a horse to water, but you can't make a drink. And, and if we truly are going to get past this, and I, I will have to agree with uh, uh, what the doctor said, that, that this is much greater than just law enforcement. We have a lot of issues here that are just, that are causing a lot of challenges in, in, our, in our communities. And if we don't take them all head on and have realistic conversations about it, we're just going to find ourselves here again, having a some conversation a little bit further down the road. We need to take, we need to sit down, we need to have some open dialogue, and we need to have respect for each other. And that's something that simply doesn't exist. And it starts at the top. I mean, I'll, I'll look at, at city administrators in cities where we're trying to have dialogue and trying to have some solutions. And 
and they create this bigger divide and it makes it real hard to have these conversations with it. And we could look, we could, ex we could explain it all the way up to the top or all the way to the bottom. But the reality is until we have, you know, people willing to sit down and have some meaningful discussions on, on a path forward, we're going to have a hard time, uh, hard time making any progress. Thank you. I think some of the things that are happening is um, when people are oppressed and uh, they are oppressed enough to when they push back, they look up to see who's holding them down. And I think right now, when they look up, they see the police. The police are being used as middle agents uh, in our society, and it's not fair. But unfortunately, that's where we're at. I think the other thing that has to happen is we have to learn in law enforcement and in leadership to understand when people are bringing up the issue, issue of systemic racism to not take it so personal. That uh, systemic racism is centuries old. It is uh, uh, just come to the point now that the more we become clear as human beings, we understand the damage that it has done. And we are saying more than anything, this systemic thing has to stop. But unfortunately, many of the people that don't understand the history of it are taking it personal. And we have to figure out how to, how to flush that out. So hold that. I'm going to get back to that with the question after this question. <laughs> so uh, the next question, uh, I came, I don't want to butcher your, your last name, is, uh, comes from Joshua. He asks, um, his question is, are there any recommended unconscious bias awareness trainings that exist that have been widely accepted by police officers? And could you make any recommendations to any of these programs in which officers wouldn't get defensive and would be willing to learn in a positive way. Nobody wants to do no self-promotion. <laughs> I, 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 listen, I don't know if any of all the departments that we have worked, when we come away, we always hear it's things like this. What we hear from the community are when I use, when I drive by and I see a police officer pulled someone over, I pray for the person that was pulled over. After being part of this, I pray for both of them now. Those are the simple things that we have to shift. Officers are human too. And uh, we just have to embrace some change here on the level of authorities. This middle agent piece that I talked about is big in this piece that we have to figure out. So yeah, I, I um, I think we're effective. Uh, we always get actually um, come back, it's just they can never afford to bring us back a second time. Chief Brooks, what do you think? Um, so I'll pick back on what Gamble said. One of the things that I um, recognized when we first started doing the training is when the, when the training started, officers were sitting there like this, right? <laughs> By the end of the training, they were leaning in to hear what we had to say. And the compliment at the end of the training was, this wasn't so bad. Yeah. So, so for me, that's a good thing. And that's good. You know, I, I laugh when people always, you know, say when they see a squad car, they get scared. And it's funny, like, even when, you know, I was in uniform driving a squad car, I see another squad car. <laughs> I get scared. <laughs> like, hold on, dude. I'm in a car. And it has nothing to do with my race. It's just the fact that, you know, am I speeding or something? And I'm in a marked squad car, right? So, I mean, people got to understand, you know, cops are the same as people, right? I mean, it just it's just how we are. So the next question I will ask is uh, from Mr. Ed Kennedy, and he asks, uh, is there any evidence of institutional racism other than a subjective opinion, and what proves it exists? I'm sitting here. You guys are there. So I mean, <laughs> so go ahead. Or do you need me to repeat it? Yeah. Uh, this is Dwayne here. Uh, sadly enough, you know, at least here in the United States, uh, a significant amount of our American institutions have systemic racism. One, because they weren't necessarily created for African Americans, Latinos, and people of color when they were designed. This is going back hundreds of years. As relates to the current environment, uh, whether you look at uh, traffic stops or if you look at uh, uh, incarceration rates, I mean, you look at it and there's no reasonableness of how do you explain the differences in African Americans, for example, that have been incarcerated based on our percentage of the population. 
or if you look at traffic stops. So yes, there's numerous levels of data. Uh, and, and I also should say this too, you always say to me, well, uh, 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 how, do you, how do you correlate that to the whole nation? Keep in mind, there's also approximately 18,000 approximately law enforcement agencies. And the numbers I just gave or examples I gave are national. I would also say though, everyday citizens can also sit down and look at your own local police department. You can actually ask questions about, I wanna know the demographics of those that have been for traffic stops. And I also would say this, we said earlier, also hold your elected officials accountable, your mayors, your city government. Uh, it's what I said before, uh, most police agencies are reflecting what? People that they work for. They work for the citizens, but in many ways, they're also working for your mayors, your city council, county commissioners, et cetera. Anybody else? So Booker, I would just say that um, there are a number of uh, studies uh, that, um, that are available everywhere, um, every academic institution and every persuasion. So, um, so you can find evidence. Just for Minnesota, uh, one of the bodies of evidence that we've been uh, talking about uh, for the last year has been a project that was uh, done by the University of Minnesota called uh, the um, Red Line Project, and it has provided historical evidence of, um, of um, institutional racism in, in banking uh, that has really led to um, a serious uh, income uh, wealth gap uh, in Minnesota. There are other reports uh, that uh, uh, outline uh, from, again, the University of Minnesota, published in the uh, New England Journal, um, Journal of Medical Science on a historical and systemic, systemic racism in regard to COVID. Uh, and um, there's reports here in the United States and similar reports in the UK. So there is a body of evidence that uh, people, the people are looking for them can find um, to, uh, I don't, um, I don't, I'm not sure why we're still questioning whether or not institutional racism exists, but if we are, there is certainly um, peer-reviewed um, evidence uh, for the pervasiveness of institutional racism in our country in a number of sectors, not just in policing. All right, thanks for that. Uh, so the next question is uh, from a Josh Jasek. Uh, it says, how would you structure this long-term slash continuous mitigating unconscious bias training in order to move away from the one and done training? Uh, Chief Brooks and I use a, um, I don't know, four layered system. We start with a needs assessment. We go into trust building with the department itself. And then we go into skills building with them. And then we train them in sustainable partnership programs with the community. So it's a long process. This is, uh, you, don't, you know, you don't just unpack this stuff. It's like opening up a suitcase and emptying it. It's not like that. This is tons of baggage that we have to get through. And the real work is teaching how to communicate in a way that you want to work together. And then the work continues with sustainable partnerships, that they continue the work. You know, our, our work is always that um, we teach them how to continue these skills, the trainings that we do, so they can do that for themselves. We, we believe in that, that whatever we do, they should be able to replicate, and it becomes sustainable. I'd like to, uh, I'd like to, to, to piggyback on that as well. And, and, and you know, this is not a box that you check. Uh, okay, we've had this training and it's done and you know, now we satisfy whatever reason we, you know, we, we had it on there. I, I think what you have, again, it goes back to the culture we talked about before and it starts at the very top. But, but we can talk and we can train all we want. We can get officers in a room and we can talk about it and we can have some meaningful discussion and maybe even have some self-reflection. But the key component to the, any success uh, of, a, uh, of this program would, would be a, a, uh, a public involvement part of it. Now, I'll just offer one as a, as a suggestion, because uh, I, I had a, you know, a, good, a good bit of experience in doing it, and that is, I don't think enough agencies across this country, and those who do it, don't do it at a, big, a large enough bandwidth, is to do citizens academies. You know, citizens academies do two things. 
one, they teach people what they, you know, they, they teach why we do the, the complexities of law enforcement that I think most don't take the time to consider when they pass judgment on the actions taken in officers. So anytime we can empower people with more information is going to be beneficial. But the other side of that is, is that it creates two-way communication. So we can talk until we're blue in the face in classrooms and tell people what they need to know, but it really is that interaction in a, in a non-threatening set, uh, you know, setting to where we can have some meaningful discussion and have that two-way dialogue that is going to help all of us calibrate our belief systems. Exactly. And I, I'd like to feed back on what uh, Patrick and Guillermo said as well, to add that um, there's, there needs to be a commitment to do this, and not just by word, but by funding. And a commitment, because there are programs that we got involved with where budgetary constraints didn't allow it to continue. And so I think that that's another piece that needs to be part of this. Can I add just really quickly about the Citizens Academies, about bringing people in to understand to do what we, what we do. Um, equally as important is something that happened in NYPD, and those are, flip that, those are community academies, where the folks that live and work in those precincts go with, to the community and learn about the history of that community and who's there and who are the informal leaders and what is it they do um, and, and how do you, again, begin to do that two-way? Because too often times we restrict who we mean by community. Um, like most of us, when we make the call, it is folks that look like my mom um, and probably around my age that show up. You're missing a whole group of people who just do not act in this way. They don't communicate in this way. And so I always caution when we say, how do we sustain this from a community perspective, is that you've got new generations of folks where this is not ideal. Um, having a, me come to you to learn what you are going to do to me is not what I call learning. And so we're also going to need to rethink about how do we present or offer up what the role is. I think part of the larger conversation about sustainability is what is the role of policing now? Because if we can answer some of these questions before we get to this, I still think the training is, is, is useful, but we're in a shift now. And we're shifting to the point where we're really questioning what's the role of police in public safety. And I think that we have to make sure that whatever we do with this particular, you know, what you want to call anti-bias or whatever, you also have to look at the systems that produce these folks. And so it's one thing to do, uh, you know, a community partner handoff, but it's another thing to look inside an organization and see how people get transferred, promoted, get special units. What is the, you know, the organizational environment inside for them that doesn't feel fair? And so we have to align a lot of things. And I, and I think that it's really important that community does learn that they hold those biases. But I think we also have the opportunity now to unpack all these other things along with it. So we don't just do one thing and try to move on. Because we, we seem to be the only lever people are pulling right now. And, and I'm going to go back to, I think somebody mentioned it, you've got housing, transportation, health, all with the same issues here. So I just want to make sure that when we talk about pulling one lever, you got to pull them all because it does reside, seem to sort of stop at the feet of police, and that, that just can no longer happen. All right, so in the interest of time, and um, I'm just gonna ask this one question and then we'll wrap up. I'm sorry for the rest of you, we couldn't get to your questions. We have some really good ones, but I think this last one will uh, give people um, a takeaway from this event, hopefully. So the last question is, is, uh, is from uh, Mr. Barry Moore, and he asks, what do you recommend as a way to bring policy in line with training to ensure the change lasts. So what, you know, what would you recommend as a way to bring policy in line with, in alignment with making sure that these types of trainings have lasting effects on departments? I'm adding the last piece, sorry. Um, one thing that I would add or say to that is we have to change the questions that we keep asking. We have to uh, make the questions match the outcomes that we want. Mm. Um, and, and I don't think we do that. I think we're stuck in an in, in, in old way of asking questions and we'll get, you know, the definition of crazy is doing the same thing over and over again. We have yeah. to change that. If we want more diversity in police, we got to ask questions that lead to that. If we want trust in the police, in, in community with police, when we're recruiting, we got to ask, what's your strength in that area? We have to attach the questions 
that match what we're looking for to see happen. Thank you. Anybody else want to wrap in on that one? I think I'll, I'll take a, a shot. I don't know if it necessarily answers this question, but I think it does, uh, it does kind of fit in this wheelhouse. Um, you know, if we look across the country, we find a number of agencies that truly get it. Uh, they are very, you know, proactive. They, they, they have great community relationships. They have low crime. They have these partnerships that exist. Uh, you know, we talk about policy and how policy meets with the outcome. I, I would suggest that maybe, you know, maybe you put in an equal amount of attention to the models of those that truly get it. Those agencies that are diverse, those agencies that truly have that, that right mixture, that's the ones we ought to be highlighting and pointing out. Because I think, you know, uh, I'm just piggyback what was just, was just said by, by Mr. Lopez. You know, when you always do what you always did, you always get what you always got. And, and if we're, I think in a, in a lot of instances, we don't know what we're not getting. Um, and I think if we can highlight those that truly have that nice, that, that good mixture uh, with, with agencies that, uh, that have that strong community relationship and are not dealing with some of the crises we see all across this country, that's the ones we ought to be learning from because they, they get it. They get it and they, they practice it every day and that's when policy meets practice. Thank you. Um, I just want to thank the panel again and thank everybody for attending. And to everybody that's watching, um, you know, you will be able to get this on social media afterwards. But here's the takeaway I really want you to get from this. If you look at everybody's bio from this session, you would have thought people would have came on here yelling at each other, screaming at each other, or having vehement disagreements about issues. What this proves is I don't think we're too far apart on these issues and how we approach them. And as a society, there is, I personally am hopeful that we can move forward and that we can continue to uh, do what we need to do to ensure that we all get along. And law enforcement, I still believe, is one of the most noble professions on the face of the earth. And I do think that our communities uh, do need and expect great policing. And we expect police officers to respect everybody. But at the same time, we have to respect the police officers that come into our neighborhoods, too. So with that, I'll turn it over to Marsha to go ahead and close us out. Thank you. Dr. Hodges, huge thanks to you for leading this discussion. And thanks to all of our panelists. Although we could go on for hours, we want to be respectful of our panelists' uh, demanding schedules. But we will be back with more discussions that will be relevant and timely to our law enforcement and our community needs. So again, uh, thank you to Target and to Thompson Reuters for making this program possible. And as you know, COVID-19 is putting a significant strain on everyone's financial resources and the National Law Enforcement Museum is no exception. This program was brought to you at no cost and we hope that you enjoyed it enough to make a donation to the museum. We can, you can find a link uh, in the chat box at the bottom of your screen, or you can go to your Zoom invite, or actually go onto our website at lawenforcementmuseum.org. Join us on September 9th for another important discussion on equitable policing throughout the coronavirus pandemic. You'll be receiving emails, updates uh, on that program, on that program over the next few weeks. Again, thank you to our sponsors, Target, Thomson Reuters, and we will see you all in a few weeks. Have a great day.